Today we're gonna to talk about a whole bunch of different things that might be holding you back as a producer or a mixer. And I'm gonna give you my take on how to solve these problems. Let's go. Now most of these things are things I either struggled with in the past and got past, if that makes any sense at all, or things that I see people still struggling with today. I'm just gonna rip right through these. Number one is not finishing songs, whether you're a songwriter, not finishing songs, whether you are a band, not finishing songs, whether you are a producer, not getting to the finish line, whether you're a beat maker, not getting something like wrapped up and done, not finishing something, whether you're a mixer and you're, you're doing endless mix revisions on yourself, not finishing something is one of the biggest things that will hold people back because it's really, really hard to grow and to learn from your past work if you don't finish it, put it away and revisit it weeks or months later. That is the best way to learn from these experiences. If you're just constantly doing endless mix revisions, if you're constantly doing endless tweaks on your song or your production, it's really, really hard to learn from it and actually grow in the long term. Quality is important, but make sure you're finishing things and moving on to the next thing. The next thing is not comparing what you're doing to other similar things that you love. Now there is a saying, uh, comparison is the thief of joy. And I think this is a really powerful saying for most things in life. However, when it comes to this topic, mixing, production, songwriting, etc., I really think that it is important important for us to compare to the greats. There was a time when I was really, really obsessed with this like Howard Benson, Chris Lord Algae, Ted Jensen, like producer, mixer, mastering thing. And they were just cranking out these rock records in like the mid 2000s that were just mind blowing to me sonically. They're just sonically mind blowing. I didn't even understand how they were getting the results they were getting. And so I spent a lot of time experimenting and also comparing the work that I was doing for clients to these albums that I thought were incredible. How did they get that snare drum to sound like that? How do I get my snare drum to sound like that? Is it the drummer? Is it the room? Is it the tuning? Is it the type of heads, the type of drum? Is it the microphone, the mic placement, the preamp, the EQ? Is it how the drummer hits? What are the things that are giving them that result? This super in-depth comparison was incredibly frustrating, but is also the reason why I can mix a snare drum like I can today. I learned from all that experimentation, from all that analyzing, why does their sound exactly like this and why can't I get mine to sound in the ballpark? Whatever it is that you do, pick your hero pieces, your hero albums or your hero songs, whether it's for mixing or songwriting or whatever, and compare your stuff to their stuff. Learn from that. Super, super important. The next thing is for mixing and it is mixing too loud. Now I've talked about this in other videos, however, I think it's really important, especially in the earlier years when it probably takes you longer to mix like it did me. It was not uncommon back in the day for it to take me 12 hours to mix a song. That was super normal. And the louder you mix, the less time you can actually mix before you start entering ear fatigue. And so I actually think it's important that the longer it takes you to mix a song, the quieter you should be for most of that mix to, to combat ear fatigue and be more productive throughout that time that you're mixing. Now when I say quietly, I mean like someone typing on a, a laptop next to me would be too distracting for me. My mouse clicking is almost as loud as the music coming out of the speakers when I'm mixing. Now of course I'm adjusting the volume up and down throughout the mix and switching speakers and switching modes on the speakers, but generally speaking I'm mixing very, very quietly and I think this is super important, again, especially if you're someone that takes a long time to mix a song. The next thing that I think huge amounts of people overlook is as a producer, this is my opinion anyway, let me, let me preface this with that. A producer's job is to shed the most marketable light on the artist's vision as possible. Now this is different depending on what genre you're in. There are different things that are appropriate for different genres, but this next thing is not being conscious of the listener's or the consumer's attention span. There was a study done a few years ago, and I'm positive this is worse now than it was then, but a couple years ago, this study looked at all the different Spotify skip rates. How fast did people skip past songs 
on Spotify. The results of this study is something that has single-handedly driven my considerations in producing music ever since I read it. I don't remember the exact numbers off the top of my head, and I'm sure they're worse now than they were then, so I'm just going to summarize for you. Something like 25% of people skipped the song in the first five seconds of the song. Something like 30% of people skipped the song in the first 10 seconds of the song. Something like 41% of people skipped to the next song in the first minute. And over 50% of people skipped to the next song without listening to it to the end. Now when I read this, a light bulb went off in my head. My job as a producer, and as a mixer for that matter, is to never let the listener get bored. The ear should always be given something to latch onto, something to pay attention to. And the better I do my job as a producer and as a mixer, the more conscious I am of making sure there is always something to focus on, the likelihood of someone skipping to the next song goes down. And so being considerate of the consumer, of the listener's attention span, when I'm mixing and when I'm producing, I think is super, super important for the success of your client's music. And don't forget, our success is tied directly to their success. If my clients are not successful, I will never be successful. If no piece of music I ever work on does well, then I will never do well. So it's our job to make the most successful music that is also true to the artist's vision as possible. Before I talk about this next topic, there are links down in the description of this video for all the things that I use, all the pieces of gear that I use, microphones, preamps, compressors, my desk, my setup, everything. Most of those links go to Sweetwater, and Sweetwater is sponsoring this video. You can get any piece of gear you ever need from Sweetwater, and I have been doing that for many, many years. If you use any of the links down below, it costs you nothing extra, but it really helps me out and helps me keep making videos just like this. And you don't have to buy just the things in those links. You can buy anything you ever needed from Sweetwater. And if you jump on any one of my videos, click on any one of the links, get anything you need, it will help this channel out, and I really, really appreciate it. Thank you, Sweetwater, for sponsoring this video. The next topic, not building productions around a vocal. Something that I see a lot of newer producers and new mixers for that matter do is not be as conscious of the vocal as they should be. Now in most genres, the vocal is the most important part. Not all genres, but in most genres, the vocal is the most important part. And in those genres that the vocal is the most important part, doing things that, that hinder the vocal, that hold the vocal back, that cover the vocal, that pull the listener's ear away from the vocal, these are things that we want to avoid. Being conscious of the vocal being the focal point for as much of the song as it's appropriate for it to be the focal point is really, really, really important. And the same in mixing. If you haven't checked out my POV mixing that I, uh, the video that I dropped just a few months ago, go check that out. You actually get to see me mix a song from beginning to end. And in that song, in that video, I did kick drum, snare drum, got some of the rest of the, the drum percussion sounds worked up. I did bass. I think it was bass synth in that song. And then I went right to the vocal and we got a slamming vocal sound. And then I mixed the rest of everything around that vocal. Now I handle most mixes that I work on just like this because I want the th whatever the thing that's most important in the song, we need to support that and we need to fill things up around that. So being really conscious of building your productions and your mixes around the vocal, make sure you give priority to the vocal, super, super important. The next thing is if you are trying to be a professional or if you are a professional, a full-time a mix engineer or producer, and you're not just working on your own music, you're actually getting paying clients. The next thing is not spending enough effort going after artists or bands for you to produce or mix for that will elevate you in your career. Now, just like I talked about a minute ago, our success is directly tied to the clients that we work with, to, the, to their music. How successful is their music? Now, on the way up as a producer or as a mixer, one of the very, very hardest things is getting really talented artists and bands to work with. It's a little bit like trying to get a credit card. They won't give you a credit card without having any established credit, but you can't have established credit without having a credit card. 
This music career works really similarly to that. And you have to be relentless with your upward pressure trying to level up throughout your career. And one of the best ways to do this is try to work with the most talented people you can possibly work with. The most talented people that will give you a shot. This lets you showcase what you can do with really talented people and will likely help you level up with the people that you can then take on as clients. Hopefully you can get better examples of what you're capable of the more talented people you work with. So really, really always be going after the most talented people that you can possibly get to work with you because this will shorten the trajectory of your career and let you continue to level up faster. The next thing is not checking your mixes on multiple speakers. I did a whole video on why professional mix engineers use multiple speakers. The synopsis of that video is basically that you would listen to your work on multiple sets of monitors, multiple sets of speakers or environments. And when you get your mix to the place where there are no changes left to be made on any of those systems, then your mix is great. You use your studio monitors. Hopefully you have a pair of Oritones or, or some other small cube monitor, a Bluetooth speaker or a boom box. You check it on your phone, you check it on your laptop, you check it on your home stereo, you check it in your car, like whatever system that you come up with. But the idea is you need to get to the place where you can check your mixes on all of these things and not hear anything you would like to change on any of them. And then you know your mix is translating well and you're gonna send it to your client and it doesn't really matter what they're listening on. It doesn't really matter if they're in their car or on earbuds or headphones because you have done your work and made sure that the mix translates to a bunch of different environments really well. Don't forget links down below for everything that I use. Thank you guys so much for watching. I hope this helped you. We'll see you in the next one. Peace.